Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello, I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today, we'll be exploring the fascinating life and career of Madame Helena Petrovna Blavatsky, who is the one of the founders of the Theosophical Society, one of the most colorful, fascinating characters of the 19th century. My guest is Gary Lachman, esoteric historian. He is the author of Madame Blavatsky, the mother of modern spirituality. He is also author of some 20 other books dealing with major trends and themes and personalities in the field of esoteric history. He's written about Rudolf Steiner, Alistair Crowley, P.D. Uspensky, Swedenborg, Jung, Colin Wilson. He's written extensively on politics and the occult. And I'm very pleased to have him with me today via Skype. So now I'll switch over to the Skype video. Welcome again, Gary. It's a pleasure to be with you and uh, to have this discussion about a, a, a person who has fascinated me for many, many decades as, as someone who was sort of immersed in the California New Age culture. I'm, I'm very much aware of the enormous debt, uh, that uh, those of us who participated in that culture, for better or worse, owe to uh, Madame Blavatsky and the Theosophical movement. Uh, it's it's just extraordinary to me yeah, how many concepts originated with her. Oh, absolutely. And um, as always, it's a pleasure to be on. No, she's one of the most remarkable um, women of, well, I'd say the 19th century, but um, practically any time. Um, and not only because of the Theosophical Society, which, of course, was very, very influential. And as I say in um, my book, it's the subtitle of the book, Madame Blavatsky, The Mother of Modern Spirituality, because uh, I think she's the one who more or less got what we consider to be sort of spirituality today kind of going with the Theosophical Society back in the 1870s in New York. Supposedly, at, at least uh, her origins, uh, and I mean by that her esoteric spiritual origins mm -hmm. are, are as, as you confess in your book, still quite mysterious. Well, you know, her background is, uh, as the cliche goes, shrouded in mystery. Um, a great deal of which um, she went out of her way to, to produce. Um, but, I mean, the general story is that she was born in Russia in Ekaterinaberg, in uh, 1831, and when she was about 17, she was married off to um, an older man. He was in his 40s, but he was considered aged, I guess, at the time. And the marriage was never consummated. And what Blavatsky did was uh, she ran off once uh, in search of the unknown, which is what she says. And as a young girl, she says that she had discovered her great-grandfather's occult library, uh, Prince Pavel Dogoruki, who was involved with um, sort of a Rosicrucian Freemasonry in the 18th century in Russia, uh, which is a, f a fascinating subject uh, in itself. And then she met other people in, in her childhood that spoke of sort of um, this kind of esoteric wisdom and the secret knowledge and things of that sort. And as soon as she could, she hightailed it uh, <laughs> from where she was in order to um, pursue this. And the story is that for some 20 years, she basically went around the globe. I mean, if you read about her life, uh, she was everywhere from, you know, Tibet to uh, Mexico or Canada. She, she talks about going across uh, the Midwest in a Conestoga wagon. She fought on the barricades with Mazzini in, in uh, Italy against the papal troops. Um, she was one of the survivors of uh, the wreck of the Eudamia, which was apparently a big um, uh, sort of uh, a maritime disaster uh, that predated the the Titanic, and this is just this is just a few things. But in terms of um, sort of uh, uh, corroborate, you know, uh, history that we can corroborate, uh, 
she she washes up um, in New York in 1873, and she's come across the Atlantic uh, uh, down like in third class, you know, uh, with with all the the immigrants. Uh, and the story is that she had a first class ticket. She came from sort of aristocratic family. Her grandmother was the daughter of a princess, and um, all that kind of thing. Uh, but just before she was going to take her first class berth, uh, she saw a family in distress, and they were supposed to be traveling in steerage, and they they had lost their tickets or something along their lines and the story is that she went and cashed in her first class ticket and bought steerage tickets for herself and the family and that's how she traveled across and she appears in um the lower east side of new york um it wasn't ellis island then uh i think it was down at the battery where people were sort of you know uh, brought into the country uh and she winds up living in in a sort of woman's working a working woman's hostel uh, in the lower east side and it's through um Basically, I mean, how she became who we know her as, as Madame Blavatsky, is that she uh, heard of these, um, she was reading these articles written by Colonel Alcott, uh, who sort of became her, 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 her Plato to her Socrates, or, 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 or kind of <laughs> Abbott to her Costello, or something like that. Uh, and um, Alcott was covering a series of uh, manifestations, a series of sort of, you know, spiritual manifestations and, and sightings uh, up in, um, I, think, I think it was up in uh, Connecticut, if I, don't, if I recall correctly. And she basically went there in order to meet him and basically to capture him, seduce him, not in a sexual sense, because uh, she thought sex was beastly. And she said throughout her life that she was celibate. But she seduced him in the sense that she got him to be sort of her kind of uh, front man, more or less. And then he met her and he was completely bowled over by her. And he starts writing about her in the newspapers. And that's how she becomes, you know, Madame Blavatsky, the, uh, the one that we know of. I think it's fair to say that when she arrived in New York, I think in 1873, the American spiritualist movement was in its heyday. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And um, Blavatsky herself uh, said to have conducted seances in Cairo and in Paris. And, you know, in her search for secret wisdom, she had met and worked with different spiritualists and different mediums uh, and so on. Uh, and certainly uh, in the States, um, uh, the, I guess 1840, 1848, the Fox Sisters start up in uh, sort of upstate New York. And by a few years later, there's a spiritualist craze across the whole country. That's went across the Atlantic over to uh, Europe as well. And Blavatsky, but she quickly became kind of public enemy number one uh, with the spiritualists because she claimed that, um, well, one of the things she claimed was that the spirits that turn up at all these uh, seances, they're not who they say they are. It's not Aunt Betty or, you know, Uncle Tom or whoever it is or Napoleon, whoever it is you're talking to. She more or less said these were sort of the hobos of the astral plane. Uh, these kind of um, sort of good for nothing, so have nothing better to do than hang out and wait for somehow humans or us to come in contact with them because they enjoy the contact and they get something out of it and all that kind of thing. Or they're basically mischievous kind of uh, entities who like uh, pulling people's legs. And what she did when she met Alcott up at these um, seances uh, where she met him was that the, the type and character of appearances, the type and character of manifestations suddenly changed. And where before it was sort of more local, kind of, you know, American Indians or something like that, all these Russian <laughs> people start turning up, all these sort of Ukraine or Cossacks sort of thing. And um, you what mean she said to Alcott, Alcott as was that she was making it happen. Spirits, yeah, there were spirits. It's sort of like a count somebody or other or something like this would, would be speaking. Uh, and what she said to Alcott was that she had, was making it happen. Mm -hmm. So she wasn't a medium, she was a magician. And she had, unlike mediums who become kind of passive, uh, well, mediums, they become passive me media for the spirits to speak through, um, she had mastered her powers and she was in control. Now, and the fact that uh, she convinced Alcott that she had these uh, powers. Uh, it certainly seems that way from his descriptions of what he observed uh, is due to a relationship that she believed she had at that time with uh, individuals she described as hidden masters. Yes, yes. She talks about the Mahatmas. Uh, the, originally, they are the masters, and then when her interest shifted from the um, ancient Western sort of hermetic tradition to, to Eastern uh, spirituality, uh, they became Mahatmas, which just basically means great souls. Uh, but again, this, this notion of hidden masters um, in the context, historically, it goes back to 
the kind of Freemasonry that her great grandfather had been involved with. Uh, this was a sort of um, uh, Freemasonry that was called strict observance. And it started up sometime in the 1750s and was an offshoot of Scottish Rite Freemasonry. But it was a much more esoteric, much more magical, um, mystical kind of Freemasonry. But one of, it was called strict observance because <laughs> the main rule was that you had to carry out without, without question and without change um, orders, commands given to you by hidden superiors, by people you did not know. Uh, you didn't know who they were, and when they, if you ever had any contact with them, they were masked and all this sort of thing. And so this idea that there were these hidden figures, these unknown superiors in the world who had this hidden wisdom and were sort of basically uh, directing things was something that you know she claimed to have been uh, aware of uh, in, in her youth. And then it gets transformed into specific characters. She says that in 1851, um, well, again, there's this variety of stories about how she first meets the masters, and they change over time, and she tells them differently. And again, as I say in the book, uh, you, there's no one story that you can point your finger to and say, this is the real one, but there's one that she tells more than others. And that one is that in 1851, uh, when she was in London here, um, visiting the Great Exhibition. This was this fantastic kind of World's Fair at the time, and they had the Crystal Palace and a variety of different architectural and cultural kind of uh, shows. And while she was there, um, this Hindu gentleman passed by, and she recognized him as the master, one of the masters whom she had met in dreams and had had visions throughout her childhood. And they later met up, and he communicated to her that what she had to do was make her way to Tibet so that she could... Um, learn to master her occult powers. They have become aware of her, and they want to send her there so that she can become their emissary and return to the West and, and you know, spread, spread the message. And, uh, in fact, uh, as you report in your book, uh, it seems likely that uh, she was in Tibet. Well, it, again, it's sort of like, it's like Tibet, how, how, you know, something called Greater Tibet or Little Tibet. I think, I think it's Ladakh, which is sort of an area that's nearby. And she claims to have been there. And she said she spent seven years in Tibet, but not seven consecutive years and like in total and that kind of thing. But even if she didn't get actually into Lhasa, which she said, you know, uh, that that didn't happen. But she said that she did reach the secret monastery uh, that was connected to the Tashalumpa uh, monastery, which, which is well known. But this was one where... It, her masters weren't Tibetans; they were Hindus, but they they operated their HQ, as it were, was 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 in Tibet. And at this secret monastery, this is where she learned how to master her powers. And she made three attempts to get to Tibet to get there. Uh, it was only in the third one that she succeeded. Mm -hmm. And she tells that story, or that story is told in you know different books about her. But in the meantime, she traveled. Like I said she traveled around mm -hmm. the world. She had these enormous, these incredible adventures. I mean, she had a life to fill about 20 other people's lives. Mm. And I have to say, one of the things I mentioned in the book, and, and I say when I do talks about Madame Blavatsky, is I'm surprised that the feminists have never really grabbed onto her. Uh, because, uh, like I said, she's one of the most remarkable women, you know, ever. And I suspect the occult, you know, stain has kept them away. It's, it's, it's uh, uh, disreputable. Uh, but uh, even Annie Besson, you know, who in her early career... Um, she later became, you know, one of the heads of, or the, the head of the Theosophical Society after Blavatsky. Um, but in her early career, she was she was a feminist. You know, she she was a, a suffragette. Uh, she was concerned with a lot of social issues. But then when she met Blavatsky, she, um, you know, basically converted. Uh, but she's another figure who's very influential in the women's movement. You would think, well, if you can accept that Annie Besant became a Theosophist, you should certainly, you know, take a look at Madame Blavatsky. Well, it, in your book, you talk about uh, after the founding of the Theosophical Society, they had publicly stated their uh, vision, their goals for the organization. And the first of these, as I recall, was to help create a society of universal brotherhood where people would see each other as equals, regardless of sex, race, color, caste, or uh, the, the normal characteristics that separate people. So... It, it would seem as if she was a great humanist from the get-go. Oh, again, I mean, this is one of the things, too. Uh, in, in a book, um, I say in, in, in my book about Blavatsky and in another book called Politics and the Occult, I, I say that, you know, um, it's ironic that she's often sort of tagged as the source of a lot of far-right 
or very conservative uh, political views, but she was actually um, a, 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 a humanist, a free-thinking uh, humanist at the time. Uh, she rebelled against the, um, the church, the Christianity. She wasn't against religion. She didn't like Christianity and Judaism very much, um, but she was very much a free thinker. Uh, and celebrated, you know, free thought and speculation and all of that sort of thing. And so, um, yeah, she was she was quite the radical um, in, in in her day. And exactly what you said, this whole idea of this brotherhood of man, you know, regardless of race, creed, color, sex, you know, income, you know, anything like that. Again, that comes out of her Masonic roots or the Masonic roots of of, of, of her great grandfather, because that was one of the aims of the Freemasonry, this brotherhood of man. And that that's the one in many ways that um, even though the other two was uh, what to sort of uh, study the ancient teachings of the past and also to study you know the world's religions and things of that sort, but this whole thing about this brotherhood of man that was something that she she actively you know threw herself into in, into her life. Mm -hmm. Well, I think she's also very closely identified with the notion of the hidden masters, and and you point out that there's some origins there in her grandfather's uh, Freemason activities, but it, it strikes me you can find it in the Hindu tradition as well. In the Bhagavad Gita, for example, Krishna, who is the avatar of uh, the god Vishnu, uh, is uh, appears to be just a charioteer oh yeah i mean yeah sure i mean i i i, I it's, it's not an idea that's sort of exclusively uh masonic but uh i think in her own history and sort of mm -hmm. the background when she was sort of first coming again this is a story she tells she first came across all this occult literature yeah. and the whole idea of this hidden wisdom is associated with these people who had it and they were out there they were out there in europe mm -hmm. and that's she wanted to go meet them she wanted to go find them she wasn't going to find exactly the ones that were spoken about in the book she read but there were others out there and that's the whole thing the, the masters become a kind of again it's sort of it's um specific individuals who who have that title and then it becomes a kind of honor that she mm -hmm. bestows upon people in her travels the people who she's learned things from the people who she shared adventures with the people who you know shared experiences with their masters you know um they're they're kind of the seekers of truth. I mean, Gurdjieff, who's um, a generation or so uh, after Madame Blavatsky, um, he has a similar kind of idea, this whole idea of the seekers of truth. This was a group of people that in his book, Meetings with Remarkable Men, he talks about in his youth and as a young man, they, they journeyed through the Holy Lands in Egypt and Central Asia in, in search of these repositories of, of secret wisdom. And that, in many ways, he was following in the footsteps of, of, of Madame Blavatsky. Well, there is a difference, I suppose, between a seeker of truth and a, a master who is well-established in a hidden monastery somewhere and who has a, a school where people are taught to uh, become highly developed psychics. Yeah, well, these, yes, the, the ones, um, Kuthumi um, uh, and, and Moira um, were um, the specific individuals who were her actual masters, who she had you know, contact with. And one of the things that's different about Blavatsky's conception of the masters and how the idea got taken up by people after her, like Annie Besant and C.W. Leadbeater and, and some others, is that for her, they were always flesh and blood people. Mm. And they're always on the same plane. They weren't ascended masters. They weren't existing in some, you know, other dimension. And you can contact them. Even though she, she contacted them or they contacted her telepathically, they were on the other side of the planet. They weren't up in the ninth dimension or something like that. And she always maintained that these are actual people. And she said one of the reasons that she was always a bit uh, protective about them and didn't want to talk about them too much and didn't want to actually bring it out into the public is that she had respect for them as people and individuals and she didn't want to draw them into this whole kind of you know publicity thing about who are the masters and that kind of thing and she even regretted later in life that she had ever brought them up because uh, it was something like you know people are naming their dogs Kuthumi now or something like that it's sort of like you know this kind of thing that was a particular person got picked up and everybody's kind of using it in a way uh, but these were real people who had they themselves had mastered their occult powers had mastered their mind i mean fundamentally she she's saying that you know the mind is you know, the final arbiter you know the mind is the power over everything and if you if you don't master your mind you have no master of anything this is why she was critical of uh, mediumship and spiritualism because for her it was giving over that control to some someone else who could you know something else that would take over she wanted to not that she wanted to be in control but to be a master you you, that, you mm -hmm. had to be able to uh, achieve that and this was something that they did 
she learned how to do. And one of the, I mean, and you know, when you start to read about her life and accounts of it, um, if you know only you know a fraction of it is true, she apparently was able to do some remarkable things. Let's, and so were they. Let's let's discuss some of the examples that have been reported that, that witnesses claim they observed her do. Well, I think one of the most well-known one is this sort of um, uh, teleportation or manifestation, uh, where something you know, she 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 would make something appear, uh, an apport or something like that. And one of the famous stories, the ones that kind of started her career in in uh, around the world, was when she was in India, and um, she had uh, the, the the journalist A. P. Sinnott had um who was uh an editor of the uh, uh the pioneer it was a big uh, newspaper there and people like kipling had you know written for it um he became very very interested in blavatsky he had heard about her and he invited her to come um and and stay with um him at his you know his estate his, his you know his, his his home and all that sort of thing and there's a story that um they were all going out the whole party was all going out on a picnic they were all going to have tea out in the jungle somewhere or something like that and um, when they got to the point, the, the spot where they were going to have their tea, uh, it, it, it came out that a, a teacup and a saucer was missing. Uh, there, was, there was one short. And almost a half joke, someone said, oh, Madam Blavatsky, couldn't you, couldn't you just sort of, you know, make one appear here for us now? And she, oh, no, no, I, I, no, no, please, please don't bother me with this. Oh, no. And they, you know, they kept, imp- in, you know, importuning her to do it. And so she finally agreed. And... After she did whatever she did, she, she, she said, okay, look there. And they had to dig into the soil quite a bit. And there, again, this is the story, they're kind of stuck behind roots, you know, that, that have clearly weren't disturbed and put back in place, was a teacup and a saucer. And it was one that actually matched um, the set that, that was there. And subsequently, they went back to see if she somehow had, you know, surreptitiously, you know, pocketed somehow a, a teacup and a saucer from the pantry and somehow <laughs> had gone and, and dug in, into the earth and found it. But there's all circumstantial evidence that suggests, well, okay, but maybe if she did that, how could she possibly get it behind all these roots where, you know, the, the, the roots had grown around the, the cup and the saucer? And how would she know that that's where they were going to go? She didn't decide on the itinerary. She didn't decide on where they were going to go to have the picnic. It was somebody else. And so that's sort of one of the big stories. And then she was known to do similar things just, you know, in other circumstances. One of the favorite things she did was kind of teleport cigarette papers. You know, she, she, she was a, a t- tobacco addict. She smoked all the time. She was constantly smoking. Again, this is one of the things that was just remarkable about her. She was so transgressive. You know, she broke the rules. She was this woman who was just smoking like a chimney all the time. Uh, but she would sort of, sort of transport, you know, her cigarette rolling papers to some place, and then someone would go there, and lo and behold, they would be there, or a ver- variety of other things. But one of the other sort of apports were the famous Mahatma letters, and this was not something that she did, but this is something that the masters did. And the masters communicated to her, and later on to Sinnott. Um, they wrote these long letters. Um, some are in red ink, and some are in blue. And actually, copies of them are at the British Library here in London. And I've gone and examined them, and they're written out in eloquent handwriting, and in a very eloquent English too. That's an English that's very, very different than Blavatsky's own writing. It's really not like it at all. Um, she kind of hammers away. She kind of pounds on the table, and she has an insistent thrust, and and she is a hectoring kind of thing, which is it, it could be thrilling at times, but after a while it gets a, it gets a little much. But this was a very eloquent, clear, you know, you know what what you would have called a BBC, you know, British in- English um, later on, and um, these letters literally appeared out of nowhere. They would just kind of out of the sky or from the ceiling and float down and they would be there and many many different reports of these sorts of things and this was the sort of thing that she had learned how to do and the the masters somehow communicated in this way uh that these letters would appear and they would have you know instructions or kind of guidance or you know spiritual teaching and that sort of thing uh and as i say if you're ever in if you're ever in london you go to the british library you can find you can check them out and they're, they're actually remarkable remarkable you know uh artifacts uh to actually have and examine
And they became quite controversial. Uh, I mean, she had a controversial life. I know you report that uh, many, many uh, writers have written books about her and, and vehemently disagree about basic facts of her life uh, and and about her character. As, as oh yeah, well. I mean, there's yeah, I mean, there's books that are just uh, character assassinations, and then there's books that are uh, hagiographies, and with. As is the case with many of the spiritual teachers, that's what you usually get. You usually get, you know, the, the hagiographies where she could do no wrong, everything she said is true, and the the person goes to great lengths to try and, you know, put everything together so it all, you know, kind of works out without any problems. And then you have the the character assassination, say she was a fraud, she was complete, you know, you know, um, you know, she was a fake. She just sort of took advantage of everything. I mean, there were ones who were saying that she was she was somehow a, a prostitute wallowing in the flesh pots of Europe. And I mean, not to sound I don't know how how this would sound, but you know, Madame Blavatsky was not a petite woman. You know, she was a very large woman, and you know, she even when she was young, and she she was quite you know she had a very uh, nice face when she was young, but she was still you know rather ample. Um, so the kind of I don't know, vision of her wallowing in the flesh pots of Europe seems a bit counterintuitive to me. Uh, and a variety of other things. And that's one of the reasons why I did my book. It, and um, In the beginning of the book, I referred to the American historian Jacques Barzin, um, who's a remarkable uh, historian, and he, he lived 104 or something like that. But he, has, um, he, he writes about having the problem with writing about someone who's too well-known. I mean, one, pro one thing you have is like... You, this, somebody who nobody knows about and they should know about them so you write about them and you introduce them then there's somebody who a lot of people know about but they know about them wrong what they know about is incorrect and what you have to do is kind of cut through all of this layer of 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 sort of this kind of, of this the sort of accretion of misconceptions about them and then you can kind of pull that away and then okay let's try to i try to sort of do that in the story not in the sense in my book not in the sense that i've got the facts i've got the real truth but i can say well, actually this account of it doesn't really hold up, this kind of thing. I mean, one of the things that was said about her, and which I, I know I'm, I'm guilty of, and I've repeated it in, in some things I've written, was that she smoked cannabis or marijuana. She smoked mm -hmm. hashish constantly. Well, um, probably not at all, because in what she actually writes, she's, she's, she was teetotal, teetotal, celibate, um, and... It, as far as I know, it was anti-drug. You know, she didn't really. She probably experimented at some time early on in her career because a lot of mediums did, um, a lot of spiritualists did. It put you in the mood, as it were. But the two accounts of her doing this, one was written early in her career by a friend, and it's a kind of um, puff piece in the sense that look at this remarkably interesting, interesting character, and here's one of the another interesting exotic thing she's done. She's been in Cairo and you know smoked hashish and blah blah blah, and later on. Another article was written by a top spiritualist at the time who hated Madame Blavatsky because of what I said, because she was saying that the spiritualist just got it all wrong. And so went out of her way to bring up every possible thing that could have been you know, horrible about her, even racial kind of attacks, saying she had negroid hair and things like that. And one of the bad things about her was that you know, she, she was a hashish addict, but probably not at all. But she certainly smoked tobacco uh, mm -hmm. enormously, and she was known to just leave ashes everywhere. And so people always kind of, you know, she wasn't, she she wasn't the uh you know uh, acme of decorum so if she was in someone's home you know she was just leaving ashes and cigarette butts you know everywhere and things of that sort mm -hmm. well she arrived in the united states in 1873 after having traveled the world and have, having had many many adventures and within 2 years of her arrival here and uh, as you point out she was practically penniless when she uh, arrived she uh, had met Colonel Alcott and uh, other people, uh, Judge, uh, William Judge, mm. who, and, and the, Judge, yeah. they, three of them founded the Theosophical Society in 1875, but I'm under the impression that while she was in the United States, the, the society itself uh, didn't really become a major movement. Um, well, she had tried a couple things before. Mm -hmm. um, there was something called the Miracle Club that she had for a while, and the whole and and she tried a different kind of. She wanted to get some kind of movement going, some kind of society going. There were a few different things. She was some I forget the fellow's name, but he was a journalist in Boston, and a variety of different attempts to get something going. And they never really 
got any traction and went anywhere. And the kind of spiritual sort of thing, in the sense of being fresh and new and exciting, was had, had, had its heyday. And she had the sense there was time for something new to happen. And it was at um, one of these get-togethers and uh, that she had with you know, as you said, uh, Alcott and Judge and other people at the time that, you know, were interested in this sort of things. And someone had given a lecture on uh, sort of the ancient canon, you know, the canon of proportions and measurements that the ancients used for the for the um, pyramids and things of that sort. And I, I think it was Judge or Alcott, I don't remember, but somebody had said, you know, oh, wouldn't it be interesting if we develop, you know, a society that was based on studying this kind of thing? And they said, yeah, that's a great idea. And then they met next to sort of come up with the idea. The, 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 well, not the idea, but the name of the thing. And they had a, different ideas for the names. And um, again, I forget who exactly you know, uh, picked theosophy, uh, but this became the Theosophical Society. And theosophy has a history hmm. uh, going back to Christ it's Christian spirituality. It comes out of Christian spirituality. It comes out of people like Jakob Burma uh, in the 16th century and, and, and even earlier. And it's, it's the wisdom of God. It's, it's knowing the wisdom of God. It's, and it's, you, you, the, the old Christian theosophist was a spiritual sort of practice to be able to you know, meditate and you know, be filled with you know, the, that wisdom of God. Whereas from um, Bavatsky Kwan, uh, Judge, and, and Alcott's point of view, it was basically this kind of scholarly kind of study of, of these sorts of things, and also of uh, anomalous phenomena, you know, what we would call paranormal phenomena, and that kind of thing. So it was kind of a scientific, uh, you know, scholarly pursuit, and, and a, a practical one, too. And they say, you know, it's sort of, there is no, there's no higher religion than truth. And their idea at the time was basically to bring kind of the... the truths of religion that had been lost, the truths of the ancient wisdom that had been lost. I mean, I said she started out it, very much pursuing the ancient hermetic tradition. Mm -hmm. um, this, this became what she wrote in Isis Unveiled. Uh, but then, and with the rising science that was happening. Uh, but yes, in, in it, the Theosophical Society itself, it attracted a lot of people. Uh, Thomas Edison, he's one of the well-known uh, early early members. Um, a fellow named Abner Doubleday, who was a Civil War hero, and who people say invented baseball. There's some controversy about that. Um, but but she did attract some well-known people at the time, but it didn't sort of kick off into a kind of mass movement. And the thing that sort of got that going, as I just said, was her, her book, Isis Unveiled, which came out about two years later in 1877, and actually was a bestseller when it came out. Well, and let's talk about how she wrote that book. It's a massive book, and it uh, was a bestseller, but it seems, uh, I've tried to read it, I find it almost <laughs> impenetrable. No, it's, 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 a, it's a difficult book, like I say, she has this thumping, hectoring style, and I, I, no, I, I couldn't read it straight through. I, I read quite a bit of it. Um, I think if you take it in chunks... Um, and it's interesting for a variety of reasons. I mean, one of the things is that it's one of the first books to present the ancient wisdom as something that is uh, analogous to contemporary science. They're, they're not they're not opposites. They're not mm -hmm. they're not in conflict. They actually complement each other. So this is something like people like you know Danikin, something like people like Fritjof Capra, you know, did later on. She's one of the first ones doing that. Also in that book, it just in the sense of history of ideas, she actually presents the first philosophical argument against Darwin. Not a religious one, but basically the, the, taking on Darwin's ideas by themselves and looking at them philosophically, not to say that they're heretical or, you know, they go against you know, church teaching. So she's, one of the she's the first one to do that, actually. I mean, the, the credit for that is usually given to Samuel Butler. Uh, who wrote Air One and The Way of All Flesh, but he also wrote a series of anti-Darwin books uh, in the 1870s. But she, her, Isis Unveiled came out in 77, and I think the first book of his like that came out in 78. Um, so it has historical importance, and then basically what she's saying is she's saying the ancients believe this, that this, this is true knowledge, whatever it is, the Gnostics or the Hermeticists or the Rosicrucians, whoever it is, and here's some contemporary science that confirms this, or, you know, basically does that and and basically here's here's all the other attitude towards science which we need to change it's too reductive and it's too you know it's too narrow and yeah it's 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 a tour de force because she brings together all this stuff but as you say how she actually wrote it well that's that's just Alcott tells of how um because they shared you know living quarters together in 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 different places and um she was living in hell's kitchen in new york in a place they called the lamasery or it came to be called the lamasery because it was all done up in Eastern and Oriental and uh, exotic kind of um, uh, decor. And there's a famous story where she had a baboon 
or a stuffed baboon that uh, was sort of done up as a kind of college professor sort of thing, and this is supposed to be kind of you know T. H. Huxley or or somebody like that, some real proponent of Darwinianism there. So, so she again, she had an enormous sense of humor. She had she had a remarkable sense of humor, uh, Vasquez. She's one of these uh, characters who you know uh, uh, she's funny. Whatever you think of her, she's she's very very funny. Um, but um, but when she was writing the book, she would sort of look out you know into like the middle distance. And then, yeah, and as if she was reading something, and the idea that she was somehow astrally reading text. She didn't have all the books at her disposal. She had already read an enormous amount, so she had an incredible memory, or at least that's the account. But then she somehow was able to visualize seeing texts that, you know, she didn't have on hand. And then she would ask people, uh, can you go to the library, the New York Public Library, and check up, you know, whatever it was, and see if I'm right, and more times than not, the story was that, that she was right. But the other thing uh, Alcott reports is that she would actually, her face would change. She would go through sort of physical changes in her whole appearance, and somehow her hair would be different, or her face would be different, and somehow she was embodying some some of the uh, the, the sources of the wisdom she was writing about somehow she she would kind of become them in some way and there's a variety of different sort of um again anomalous sorts of experiences that that took place in in, in the course of the writing but the the publisher um was was absolutely you know flummoxed when he produced i think an edition of about a thousand copies that sold out like immediately and the, and they actually actually was at pains to try and produce more copies because more, more and more people wanted it. And it, it got, you know, a lot of bad reviews in the sense that it's just a rehash of a lot of other stuff. But some, some people actually got very, very good reviews and it, it more or less established her. But again, this is one of the odd questions is, was after that, um, not too long after that, she decides to go to India. Mm -hmm. And and uh, it's wh why wh why are you going to India now? And this was something that happened. And she went to India like very soon after she got U.S. citizenship. So actually when she traveled to India I mean, and then after that traveled through Europe and all that she was a US citizen it's it's it's, it's Russian origin but she was a US citizen living in India then she gets kicked out of India basically uh, we'll, we'll get on to that and then he's, she spends her last days wandering through uh, Europe and then finally uh, here in London so the, the headquarters of the Theosophical Society actually moved with her to India I believe Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it finally wound up in Adyar, uh, which is still there. But again, there's, there's, there's Theosophical Society in England, there's a Theosophical Society in America, there's a Theosophical Society. So over time, these things broke up, and there were, especially after Blavatsky died, um, there was um, a kind of struggle you know, for, you know, who, who's going to carry on. And this, this sadly usually happens in, in these kind of things. Um, but um, for some reason, they, she and Alcott decided to um, join forces with this Hindu, uh, it, was, it, was, it was like a national, it was a Hindu nationalist group. Uh, mm. And again, the idea was unavoidably sort of political um, concerns come into this because one of the aspects of Hindu nationalism was to go back to their ancient traditions, you know, to revive them. Um, I tell the story in the book, and it's a little bit ahead, but uh, during her last days here in London, um, one of the people who came to visit Madame Blavatsky was Gandhi. And Gandhi was here in London, and uh, I say in talks, he was doing his best to be Bill, uh, uh, Ben Kingsley, in the sense he was trying to be, you know, a, a, an Englishman. He was brought up to be English, and he was sent from India to come and study, and he had the bowler and the umbrella and all this kind of thing. And the story is that he met... He, he met two theosophists who were interested in him just because he was Indian, and they, they, you know, started up a conversation. And they had been reading a lot of Hindu literature and all that, and they said, oh my God, wouldn't it be a wonderful thing to read the Bhagavad Gita in the original language? And he had to admit that he had never read it in any language. He hadn't read it, you know, he had, it wasn't available to him. And they said, oh, well, you must come with us. And they took him to meet um, Blavatsky. And it was through meeting Blavatsky that Gandhi was introduced to his own tradition. And to the, his last day, I mean, he wrote about theosophy as, as a positive force in the world in, in like the very day that he was assassinated. Um, I mean, you can, you can find it. So th this was something that they were doing. I mean, the, they didn't start out necessarily being political, but it got, got into a political context because it was about, you know, mm -hmm. going back to the roots of the, of the ancient tradition, of the old tradition there. So they got involved with the Indian group that was doing that there, and that's why they moved 
basically mm. pulled up stakes and went to India. But soon after they were there, they realized that their their purposes were different and, and, and they split apart. But it was when they got to India that the Theosophical Society really took off as, 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 a, as an enormous mass yeah. movement. You mean Olcott and uh, Blavatsky? Uh, Olcott and Blavatsky. Out. I mean, some other some other people came with them, yeah. but you know, they they went there. I mean, uh, Olcott himself became an incredibly influential and honored person. Uh, in well, it's Sri Lanka now, but in Ceylon, again, he went there and he basically taught Buddhism to Buddhists. He brought he brought Buddhism to people whose culture is Buddhist, but they didn't know anything about it because the Christian missionary you know, um, work was going on and they were basically saying, no, that's all superstitious stuff. You have to, you know, read the Gospels and, and so on and so on. And in um, Colombo, there's a, you know, well, there's a stamp, there's a, you know, a train station, there's a variety of different sort of civic and uh, national monuments to, to Alcott because he, he, he wrote a Buddhist catechism. He basically wrote a kind of textbook for, you know, mm-hmm. people to learn Buddhism. Uh, so if, if you think about, you know, someone, a Christian coming to, I don't know, England, and they, they didn't know anything about Christianity, and, and they, here, you know, <laughs> we're going to teach you now. It's, 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 it's something along those lines. So they were both enormously loved in India, too. And again, Blavatsky's always sort of tarred with this racism stuff, because she talks about root races in, in, uh, in her books, mostly in, in The Secret Doctrine. Um, but she had, you know, she didn't, display any of that in her life you know she didn't she didn't um she didn't hang out with the europeans who were there she avoided the white people who were there she basically went native and was living with the natives and all that kind of thing and the white aristocracy or elite who were there uh they were shocked at all this you know it was like oh you know and and again she's a russian um a russian american citizen going camping out with the hindu natives there Mm -hmm. so it's a remarkable kind of Here's the Brotherhood of Man, all in one big package in, in Madame Blavatsky. And, and as I understand it, she and Alcott actually received a, a Buddhist initiation. In Apparently uh, they were the first Europeans to be convert to Buddhism. Mm-hmm. Th- this is the story. I mean, it may have been earlier, but everything I read, they were the first ones. And it was a big ceremony and all that. And actually they were sort of brought around the country. Mm-hmm. You know, they were taken to different places and all that. And this is how she got on the bad side of, you know, the, the British, um, you know, the, the Raj uh, there. Because she didn't care for them. She, like I said, she, she had, you know, she didn't have anything good, or very little good to say about Christianity or the, the Judeo-Christian um, kind of uh, tradition and all that. And she was basically there undermining the work of the missionaries and, and bringing, you know, the ancient traditions, the Bhagavad Gita, the Upanishads, the Vedas, all, you know, the Ramayana, all this kind of stuff to, to the people who, they should have known this already. Yeah. And so she got on their bad side. And so it, forces were there ready to find something they could use against her. And this is fundamentally what happens. Well, while she was critical of the Judeo-Christian tradition, I understand that she also considered herself a, a very serious student of the Hebrew Kabbalah. Oh, yeah. It's it's part of the hidden wisdom. Mm-hmm. It's part of this tradition. Um, and this is something that today people um, uh, talk about uh, as the traditionalist school. Uh, we, we talked about this um, in one of the other interviews. People like Rene Gainon and then that, but yeah. also goes back. It goes back to the Renaissance. It goes back to. Uh, it goes back to the rediscovery of the the Corpus Hermeticum, the Hermetic writings, mm-hmm. and this whole idea of the the perennial philosophy. And mm-hmm. there's the idea was that back in ancient time there was a fundamental revelation of truth and. This disseminated out into the great religions, uh, and, and you can find it in their heart. So, um, yeah, she no, she was a student of Kabbalah, and it's she didn't have anything against sort of Jews themselves or Christians themselves. It was the you know, the, but, but she she found it a, a very um, what do you want to call it um, restraining, you know, repressive kind of teaching. Uh, but when she lived in Lower East Side. Um, she 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 was a seamstress. She worked, you know, sewing for you know, Jewish tailors and things of that sort. So, uh, but this is the free thinking side of her. You know, the the, the argument she had against Judeo Christian, you know, tradition are the same ones that people like um, William Blake had. He was a Christian, but he was very radical, uh, eccentric, esoteric kind of Christian. Or later, people like Nietzsche, who was basically seen um, the kind of Christianity, not not the 
you know, esoteric or, or the real Christianity, but the, you know, the bourgeois, you know, kind of complacent, um, you know, uh, lip-serving Christianity of Europe at the time as, as, you know, something that was a repressive um, uh, influence. And this is the same thing that Blavatsky uh, mm -hmm. uh, railed against. You raised an interesting argument in, in your book, uh, suggesting that at least some people uh, think, or p people around Blavatsky may have thought, that the rise of spiritualism as a, an enormous social fad in the uh, 19th century in America and then throughout Europe and even into Latin America, uh, that there were esoteric forces behind that, that it, it wasn't what it appeared to be. Well, the idea is that there are, at some point, there was a committee, let's say, of, of higher masters or, you know, masters uh, throughout the world. And Rudolf Steiner talks about this as well. And, and, and he's trying to understand, like, what Blavatsky's place in this history. And um, the idea was that um, the rise of materialism, of scientific reductionism and all that kind of thing was just, it was just, moving on too quickly it was dominating too much and so something needed to be done in order to you know um stop it or, or hold it back and you you could say you had the conservative uh masters who were saying well you know we, we we have to keep these teachings you know special and secret if we send them out into um you know uh, the masses they'll just get kind of you know watered down and 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 and, and corrupted and the more liberal or progressive saying no we just have to get the message out there we have to do something so that people become aware that there's more rea more to reality than just you know the material world and all that and so the idea was that okay let's we'll do this we'll do this and the thing that they did was spiritualism they somehow enabled it to happen or facilitated it happen or instigated it happening and subsequently everyone thought well actually it didn't work it was ac actually it was, it was a mistake and it kind of sent things you know in in, in the wrong direction and I guess Blavatsky's mission was to rectify that, was to come and sort of, you know, um, steer things back on uh, the track so that the West could become aware of this ancient wisdom and also the wisdom of the East, which says that there's much more to reality than, than just the material world. Mm -hmm. Now, um I know I'm jumping around a little bit, but I guess it's time. Um, it's time. She did. <laughs> <laughs> yes, she she certainly did, and I, I I'm impressed in the just right now in our discussion. Thinking here is a woman who, to my understanding, never had any you know formal formal higher education, and yet wrote these very very abstract scholarly books about uh, mystical truths and uh, drawing upon many many cultures. But she did it in not in the way that a uh, highly educated scholar would do, but in, in almost, you know, like a, um, well, a world traveler. and mm. uh, um, During her travels, she wrote stories or accounts for Russian newspapers. She had a long relationship with one Russian news, uh, uh, publisher who would publish you know, her stuff and all that kind of thing. Um, and, um, no, she was, she was autodidact, and, and she um, just wrote, uh, read uh, a great deal. Um, and as I said, when, when she discovered her grandfather's uh, library, this was the way she went. So, no, she she read an enormous amount. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm saying she's up to date on everything at the time. I get that's another thing that makes Isis Unveiled an interesting book, is you can get an idea of like what were people interested in at this time. There's this is long section about the, the the health benefits of blue glass, um, the idea of sunlight coming through blue glass or you know any kind of light passing through blue glass the the, the light reaching your body had healing properties and all this kind of thing and th th there's still something along those lines these days there's a variety of different therapies mm -hmm. that have to do with color and light and all that kind of thing but this was something at the time this is you know she's writing at 1875 76 something like that you know we published 1877 so 1876 she's writing it and all that so this is stuff that was in the news and she she's talking about stuff hot off the presses she's talking about books that are just coming out and all that so again you know it provides a fantastic kind of snapshot or, or actually collection of snapshot of what was on people's minds then what what was what was the popular concerns then um uh, so she's she and she's very much again she's very much up to date in the moment what's going on and all that kind of thing um not the retiring type at all uh, she wasn't just secluded in her study she was out there knocking about with everything all the time and still managed to absorb an enormous amount of material and reproduce it and, you know, give it back in, in a form that, you know, 
we might not find it as readable, but I think it was sort of, you know, you get value for money. You get everything you want is here. It's all here, right here. And she sort of did that. I, I guess we need to get into the investigation of Madame um, Blavatsky you know, by the Society for Psychical Research. Yeah, well, this is sort of her downfall, uh, as it were. Um, when she was in India, and the Mahatma letters are you know falling out of the air, and actually, occasionally a master makes an appearance um, to you know whatever impress in some way or teach or whatever uh, you know the reason may be, and um, what happens is that this old acquaintance or old friend, uh, Man Bavatsky, um, uh, Madame Kolum, um, whom she knew in Cairo. Uh, as a fellow kind of medium or psychic, gets in touch with her. Um, she's read about her success in the newspapers and all that kind of thing. And I think they, I think they were stuck in Colombo or something like that, uh, she and her husband. And Madame Lovatsky was a soft touch in many ways. She was a Russian, very sentimental, very generous, very open, very trusting, very communal, all that kind of thing. And so she basically said, oh, come here. You know, this uh, Madame Colomb was down and out. They, they didn't have any money. They didn't know what to do and all that kind of thing. So she said, oh, dear friend, why don't you come here and we'll find something for you to do. So Madame Colomb and her husband go. And they became kind of, you know, I know caretakers of sort of the, you know, the, the headquarters and that kind of thing. Um, but gradually... The idea is that she builds up a resentment against Blavatsky and builds up a resentment against the other members of the Theosophical Society there. They're, they're, they're not really included in um, that kind of thing. And um, she takes a story that everything Blavatsky is doing is just faked. It's a complete fraud. It's all invention. Um, you know, the Mahatma letters are coming through cracks in, in the floorboards. And uh, the vision of the Kudhumi walking by is basically someone is there's a kind of paper mache, you know, figure that's kind of you know, carried along <laughs> by the window, and it looks like oh there he goes that kind of thing, and so she takes this story um, to one of the to, to the Christian missionaries, uh, who are ready for anything, anything they can get about Madame Vasky, they're ready for it, and they just publish all of her you know. Uh, all these accusations she makes and all this kind of thing, and it's the big expose and all this sort of stuff, and this happens just at the same time as the the the, the 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 newly discovered you know not the newly discovered newly created society for psychical research uh, here here in here in England um, she's met them she's come to London at some point she's a famous story where she's here in London and, and, and meets uh, you know various members of that and they they say we would love to investigate you you know we'd love to come you know and basically corroborate y your claims or the claims made about you um, and uh, and basically they send a fellow named Richard Hodgson. Uh, to India to do that. But when he arrives, Vatsky isn't there. Um, this whole scandal has erupted. And um, he, he never talks to her, and he never actually witnesses any of the manifestations. He's, he's just getting all the, you know, all the reports, all the second hand. Long story short, um, he comes to the conclusion that she's a remarkable character, but she's one of the most, you know, remarkable hucksters in, 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 in history. And it's all fake and it's all a fraud. And most likely she's a Russian spy. Uh, and this was the time of the great game. If you remember Kim, you know, uh, K Kipling's Kim. This is the, the time where Russia and Great Britain or in this kind of struggle for uh, influence um, in India and in the Himalayas and all this kind of area. And the, his idea is that, you know, she's spying on the British. That's why she's hanging out with Sinnott. And Sinnott is friends with, you know, different sort of, you know, British colonialist officials and things of that sort. Uh, and that's why, whatever. So the thing she's most outraged about is that she's accused of being a Russian spy mm. uh, in, in the end. You know, she, she's been called a fake before. <laughs> that doesn't bother her. But to be called a Russian spy is just like, ah, you know, this just, this drives her mad. And she wants to, she wants to go to court. She wants to have it out and all that. The Theosophical Society get a little cold feet about this. They say, well, look, look, HPB, is, is, you know, Helena Petrovich Blavatsky, as she was known, they basically say, look, if you take this to court, if you sue, you know, Hodgson or whoever, if you sue the missionary newspaper that's printing all this muck about you, eventually you're going to be asked to produce the masters. You're going to be, where are they? Ha please, all you have to do is them to show up. <laughs> They'll, you know that that'll that'll confirm everything, and that's the last thing she wants to do. She doesn't want to draw the masters into this this whole mess and all that. So she becomes a martyr, and she decides to leave. She leaves India. She she leaves. She doesn't leave the Theosophical Society, but she sort of leaves India. She she leaves Adyar, and this is where she 
starts this you know she becomes the, the sort of the one you know the wandering jew in a way she becomes the wandering the wandering madam uh, the interesting thing about the 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 society for psychic researchers um account is i forget it was, it was sometime in the 1980s um I, again I, I i forget the name of the fellow who did this but he was a member of the society for psychic research and he went over Hodgson's account, and he just saw it flaw after flaw after flaw, and you know, uh, circumstantial and surmise and a variety of different things. And what the Society of Psycho Research actually did was they they withdrew it. They withdrew this account. They withdrew his report as unsubstantiated. So it doesn't mean that it, it was true what she did, but it meant that Hodgson's account calling her a fraud was actually flawed. And and funny thing about Hodgson himself is that that was his one of his first cases. And one of the things the Society for Psycho Research was intent on doing was being more scientific than the scientists, because it had to prove to them that the stuff it was studying was real. So they went through, an, you know, incredible layers of, you know, fact checking and you know whatever and that kind of thing. And they were, in many ways, more interested in disproving it yeah. than than actually proving it, because they they wanted to show that we're not being taken in. Uh, so that was kind of his his motivation in doing this. But then subsequently, he became a convert. He he, he was convinced by, by by other studies and all that. So I say in the book that well, you know, in a, in a way, the the jury's still out on whether you know. We all know it's incredible. We all know it's absolutely, you know, fantastic. The sorts of things she claimed and claimed uh, was claimed about her. But I, I think we still have to give it the benefit of the doubt because this one investigation into her, uh, well, supposed investigation into her, you know, powers and abilities was actually considered flawed from the people who did it. The uh, Society for Psychical Research, as I recall, actually issued a formal apology to the Theosophical Society. Uh, and then later on, they said, yes, we issued the apology. We did bad research, but that doesn't mean she didn't cheat. <laughs> Well, I mean, yeah. I mean, again, it it, it doesn't it doesn't you know. Well, I, I guess you're caught between a rock and a hard place. You sort of yeah. like, well, okay, you know. But I mean, I, I, I say in the book, you know, there's other examples of this kind of teleport sort of thing. You know, mm -hmm. a, a, a variety of different um, you know mystics have you know have, have claimed to have done it and that sort of thing. So it's not without precedent. In, in uh, fact, again, it's. Uh, viewer, no viewers of this channel might be interested in the interview with Stanley Krippner on his study of the apports of a Brazilian uh, medium known as Amir Amadin. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, so again, it, it's there. So uh, again, it's it's absolutely fantastic. But then that's precisely what she wanted to do. She wanted to challenge our ideas about what we accept as reality. And she says, she said later on, she just she refused later in life to do any kind of, you know. Thing. She wouldn't manifest anything. She wouldn't, you know, make any phenomena happen. She refused to do it and all that. And she actually disparaged all that kind of stuff. And as is in the ancient Hindu tradition, you know, the cities and all the power. These are stuff that, yes, this is stuff that'll happen along the way. But don't get mm -hmm. too caught up in that because that's not the real, you know, that's not the real goal. It's this, you know, it's this sort of mm -hmm. spiritual enlightenment that's the real goal for her. And so she's just, she sort of, you know, sort of stopped doing that kind of thing for for a long time. I think it's interesting that in the wake of Madame Blavatsky, there are even today uh, a number of different spiritual organizations that claim to be receiving channeled messages from the very same hidden masters, uh, Kudhumi and Moria and, and others uh, that were associated with Blavatsky. Well, this is the thing. It was kind of after her death, you know, who's got the hotline, you know, to the masters now? Um, and this, I mean, Colonel Alcott said that he had some contact with him, but he, he never really claimed in that sort of, uh, in the same way. Um, and the two people who really more or less established or said they established contact with the masters was Annie Besant and, and C Charles Leadbeater. Uh, and Annie Besant, she didn't have, she wasn't particularly... Um, psychic. She didn't have sort of the same kind of abilities, but Leadbeater apparently, you know, was able to. And, and uh, they started reading the Akashic record, that kind of thing that you know uh, Blavatsky talks about in the Secret Doctrine, and it's this kind of imperishable record of everything that's happened in the cosmos. And uh, if if you develop your psychic abilities, you can read this and something. This is something that Rudolf Steiner, um, you know, claimed to be able to do as well. But again, with Besson and Leadbeater, they became these kind of ascended masters, and this was something Elizabeth Clare Prophet, you know, later on in the 80s and 90s, um, mm -hmm. you know, claimed to do, and uh, St. Germain, and uh, another one is uh, Alice Bailey, 
Um, she claimed to have contact with one of kind of the minor masters, uh, Dwaj Kool. He, he makes an appearance, you know, in the Blavatsky years, but not not as much. And he, he kind of you know comes into the story uh, more with her. And again, she, at the end of her days, Blavatsky said, you know, they're they're real people. The real people over there, on the other side of the planet, they're not up there in the skies and all that kind of thing. But it just that 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 kind of lost. Um, its power and and the 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 whole idea that you could mm. and again she complained it sounds like anybody can get in contact with the masters now and it, it just isn't like that but you know it, it, the the, mm. the horse had already bolted you know uh, from the stable as it were and you couldn't kind of uh, get it back but yes you have many many people claiming claiming this these days and again I would say if you check what Blavatsky said the master said and if you check what these other people are saying they say it's you can find a lot of things that are very very different and they're not they're not on they're not on the same page as it were yeah. all to, the time at least today the theosophical society i i believe in the united states they are very small but active they have mm -hmm. i think five thousand members roughly in in the united states but their influence uh going you know back a hundred years is just vast it's it's hard to find a uh spiritual organization anywhere that hasn't been somehow influenced by theosophy and, and not only that I, one of the things i point out in the book is the avocado was introduced into the California agricultural um, system by theosophists. There was a theosophical, it's still, I, I suspect it's still there, out, out, outside of San Diego. Uh, there was a woman named Catherine Tingley. Um, one of the things I should say is theosoph theosophy and theosophical society has produced a lot of women um, mm -hmm. spiritual guides. Uh, the men are not quite as powerful in it, and the ones who are powerful have broken away and done their own thing, like, like Steiner. Mm -hmm. uh, they tend to take a backseat they tend to be supportive of the the women um teachers uh, as alcott was of blavatsky but kathleen uh, tingley was an american theosophist who who went off in, in point loma on uh, sandy of san diego and set up a whole sort of theosophical uh, estate there buildings uh, buildings like i think she based a lot of them on sort of ancient hindu structures and things of that sort but one of the things they did was introduce the avocado Hmm. And so the California diet, and you think everybody in California has been eating avocados now for years and years and years and years. They have the Theosophical <laughs> Society to thank to thank yeah, for it. Yeah. Um, and uh, I mean, that's one thing, which is you, it, it sounds funny, but that's that shows you how practical it's and how a, kind of concrete the influence was. It's emblematic, I suppose, of uh, of their influence overall. Well, Gary, uh, once again, this has been a fascinating discussion. I know we could keep going for another hour about Madame Blavatsky and all of her intrigues and, and her vast influence, but I'm very happy that uh, we've covered most of the highlights, I think, of, of her oh, life at, at this point. So uh, once again, thank you for being with me. And, Absolutely my pleasure. And once again, I look forward to doing more with you as as well. I know we uh, haven't even covered a, a small fraction yet of your writing. So. <laughs> well, as always, Jeffrey, I, I, look to, I look forward to speaking with you again, too. Thank you so much, Gary. My pleasure.